Hello everyone, welcome to or back to Reptile Coffee Club. It looks like we are live. My name is Hunter Hauk. I'm the host and I am here today with, let's see here if I can do this right, Gracie, Hi. my co-host. Thank you so much for joining me, Gracie. Hi, everybody. Of course. So today, so. yeah, today we have Liam from Reptile and Research, which is very, very exciting. But first, we just have a couple of housekeeping things before we bring Liam on. First, if you want Reptile Coffee Club as a podcast in whatever podcast streaming app you use, you can go join the Patreon for as little as $1 a month. And we both have Reptile Coffee Club mugs, which are now available to you at Shop Hunter Hawk. So check out the link. It's in the chat and the stream and all of those places. So definitely check it out. Now, if you have any like, yeah, thank you. If you have anything to ask the show, email us or leave it in the chat. But without further ado, Welcome, Liam from Reptiles and Research. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. How are of you course. today? I'm good. Been anticipating this all day. Awesome. Yeah, same. It's always when we have one of these, it's like an all day ordeal getting ready, and it always ends up being very fun. Yeah, definitely. I don't do much live, so it's very different for me. Yeah, it's strange because you have to like constantly keep the conversation moving. There's no cuts, which always makes me a little nervous, but. It always ends up working out. <laughs> Me too. You don't have the power of post. You're like, I just cut that out. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, stumble. wait, I misspoke. <laughs> Essentially. <laughs> yeah. So I guess first we just wanted to start off with something very basic. Um, You speak a lot on your channel about reptile husbandry. That's kind of what you do. So for anyone who's unsure of what reptile husbandry science is, can you define that term for us? Reptile husbandry, well, husbandry is the care of something. So your day-to-day, -day, whether that be um, weight checks, whether that be full cleans, whether that be feeding, it's the entire regimen around the animal's care. And obviously reptile, just specific to reptiles. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So, so animal... I have... Oh, Sorry, go is ahead. That, yeah, so animal welfare science, what would you say that is? So animal welfare science is the study of how an animal copes with its environment. There's quite a, di a few different definitions, um, but in a nutshell, it's how well the animal does. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it seems like that's a very important part of reptile keeping that a lot of people don't think about a lot, but it's definitely something we need to be very focused on. There are some very detailed definitions, and now I've been asked on the spot, I don't know them. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. It's always, yeah. But I have the videos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go check out Liam's channel if you want to see like a very in-depth dive into that. So what reptiles do you personally keep right now? So and other I, animals. So I have, well, technically, I've just lost a species, uh, subspecies. I keep Mexican black king snakes and the California king snakes. They've recently been reclassified as all California king snakes now. Yeah. So technically, I've got two species, which is a bearded dragon and a California king snakes, technically. And then I've got a fair few invert species of awesome. spiders. Interesting. Thank you. So how did you start keeping reptiles and how has your care kind of changed over time? I know we all have gone through quite some drastic changes as we learn more. Yeah, I mean, I started keeping oh, three, nearly just over three, nearly four years. Um, I started keeping other things like fish and things like that. And then I didn't really get into reptiles until very late on after doing my, my uh, degree and such. I kept okay. inverts and I bred a lot of inverts up to that. So a lot of the mm. things like humidity and how to uh, manipulate temperatures and humidity and bioactive soils and um, things like that were already in my head. So when I went yeah. into reptiles, it was kind of just like turning mission go sort of thing. But I have awesome. <clears throat> my husbandry that the, the cause, cause of the way my YouTube channel is, it forces me to 
to be researching and learning constantly. So not mm. only is the videos for people watching, but also it ends up meaning that I change my husbandry like every 14 days, it feels like. Yeah. I'm so far <laughs> down the rabbit hole now on some things. <laughs> Oh yeah, I feel that. Sometimes it's like there's always new information coming out, so your care has to be constantly evolving or else you feel like, oh no, I'm getting left in the dust. For sure. <laughs> I mean, if you're not... I mean, my my whole slogan is if you're not advancing, you're stagnating. So Yeah, that's awesome. Which is the complete opposite of people who have been doing the same thing for 30 years and not changed one thing. Yeah, that's, <laughs> Lunacy. that's like the prime example of stagnation in reptile care right there mm -hmm. definitely and so liam you recently graduated with a bachelor of science with honors in animal management and i had to scroll back on your community tab to find that but what was the process of getting that degree and what do you plan on using it for <clears throat> so the process of getting the degree was it's pretty much the same as any other degree so i went to a university called university center spa schultz they have an on-site on-site zoo so um part of it is husbandry um part of it is a lot of theory with university it's a lot of theory when i did my um college diplomas and stuff there before it was a lot more practical but when you get into like the real nitty-gritty um side of things for university it's very much theory based so that's anything from animal health to ecology to um you know wildlife rehab to exotic husbandry like reptiles as well um it's essentially a degree that that will allow you to be a zookeeper in the uk especially um typically you need a degree to apply for like head keeper positions at zoos and stuff so that was my original purpose of going was that i wanted to um work in zoos so that okay. was going to make me more um give me an advantage over competition when applying for jobs and really you need it nowadays i remember when i applied for a job listed at my local zoo and it was, it was like a junior keeper role and it was like all you need is your gccs which is like what you, the the uh, qualifications you get when you leave school so it's very different to america but it was basically like school leavers qualifications and even then it was people with degrees applying for that job that's mm. how competitive it is so yeah. it's, it's pretty much impossible to not become a zookeeper without it's impossible to become a zookeeper without a degree nowadays so that was my main intent and obviously yeah. in the middle of doing my degree i started this youtube thing because i got frustrated with the poorness of information on youtube mm -hmm. um there's actually a certain creator's one video that annoyed me enough to make me start um i won't say i won't say who um <laughs> but since then i've been doing this and the good thing about doing a degree is it, it, it instills this level of like um, critical thinking within you and mm -hmm. the ability to not only read papers, but disseminate information. So mm -hmm. that really went hand in hand with what my channel is. So I'm basically carrying on what I did for a science in uni, just in YouTube form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like that. I like how you are able to get like a paper. I like the specifically the one that you did with different snake enclosure sizes, that study, and kind of talk about what it means, read the study, and then explain it in layman's terms to all of us who have not quite as much of an idea of how to understand that. Well, yeah, I mean, anyone can read a study. I mean, any right. single person can go to, go to Google Scholar and just do like a Google search term to find studies and read them. Mm -hmm. uh, but not everyone has the ability to like, understand what they're reading especially right. when the whole thing's full of citations and brackets all over the place and you're <laughs> like what am i reading um yeah. sometimes people just want someone else to help them along and i think that's what i'm trying to do with that series um awesome. and i think people like the fact that i also know how to catch some things out sometimes mm -hmm. where some things might go over your head if you if you aren't necessarily all about that i think yeah exactly So I know we kind of already went over this question in the last question, but um, when and why did you start your YouTube channel, Reptiles and Research? So I uploaded my first proper video on April 19th, 2020. Um, the reason I started was there's so much folklore husbandry in keeping 
reptiles that it's beyond ridiculous so the the idea was to actually start putting out some science-based and research-based um information on youtube because no one had ever done that on youtube it was always people yeah. would go watch another person's video and just make their own video and parrot that and it would just go down this line of the same things spreading across and then the youtube all of that stuff seeps into the everyday world and it seeps into the facebook groups and that's how yeah. like, the myth starts and spreads and now you've got people like oh you can't have a bearded dragon on substrate or <laughs> they can't give it water they'll die a little bit of humidity they'll die so there's so many <laughs> things that are just myths that just need stamping out um mm. and just the level absolutely the level of understanding animal welfare is quite low um to the everyday person you can understand that really i mean you can buy a a bearded dragon from from the pet shop and they'll say yeah just you know give it x y and z and you're good to go and then it doesn't go past that right but i wanted to install like a level of animal welfare into people that they hadn't had that knowledge of before it turns oh. on that switch of like critical thinking absolutely that people didn't have before and I, no one's ever done it so i wanted to see how far i could take it with youtube yeah, you're definitely bringing a new thing to the reptile community that we might not have know we need, knew we needed, and it's definitely something that we did need. And that kind of brings us into the next question, which is the reptile community, or at least parts of it, are kind of an echo chamber of misinformation. For example, rack keeping, outdated information, etc. What can we do to kind of change this and bring in true information? Um. <laughs> if I knew the answer at large, I'd have done it by now. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, the first thing is to change your mindset. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a philosophy that needs to change in keeping, and that is science-based or evidence-based husbandry. Mm -hmm. Now, people think uh, there's this thing in the hobby where everyone values experience, and yes, experience is very, very valuable, but. <laughs> There's people who are absolute like geniuses in this hobby that you should absolutely listen to. And there's some people that have been keeping poorly for decades. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that they know what they're talking about. So just the the years aren't the only indicator of knowledge, so to speak. So uh -huh. you have to take an approach of experience coupled with science. Now, lately in this world, there's like a fear of science in general. So like yeah. an anti science vibe nowadays, but you have to go by what is logical and presented in evidence, and mm -hmm. that's how, how you improve. I mean, there's so many things that you would not know unless someone did the study. Yeah, and then, like I've got a collaboration with Laurie Terrini, and I won't go into too much because mm -hmm. I won't give it away, but there's let's just, let's just say I'll say one thing. Keeping in racks in unstimulating environments may be changing the brain structure of snakes. Okay. That's that, really that's, interesting. I'm excited I'm to say. see that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, <laughs> that that <laughs> but I'm yeah, really looking think, forward to that. There's so much that the hobby is just sleeping on, and it could mm -hmm. be something else, and it's just not. But it yeah. takes it it takes people to 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 realize what is evidence based and what is not. Mm -hmm. So I think when people start actually, hey, I disagree with you, and then start citing studies, and this is why, because X, Y, and Z, rather than my opinion, is equally mm -hmm. as valued as science, because it's not. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like someone will provide factual information in a Facebook group, and then someone will reply, well, I've been doing this for longer, or in my case, longer than you've been alive, and mm -hmm. all my snakes are still alive. I'm like, well, just because you've been doing it a long time doesn't mean you've been doing it well. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, exactly. I, I get that all the time, to be yeah. honest. Especially when, when you are young, you you will mm -hmm. run into that issue. But the thing is, I find that so funny because someone will say that to me, but I'm like, and they'll say, why don't you listen to people that are older than you? I was like, but I do listen to people that are older than me, just that you're over here keeping awful. And the person that I yeah. listen to that's kept longer than you is over here keeping like a, to a really high standard. Yeah. And they, they, they literally have had the exact op opposite experience of you. And I know that this person over here is keeping poorly. It's half of it is, is just clinging on to 
low costs and 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 money making. Oh, yeah. So who do I who do I trust? The experienced person who's an ex ex zookeeper over, over here who's keeping mm -hmm. the pets, or the person who's out to make a profit? Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great way of thinking about it because, yeah, and I guess moving on to our next topic. So I know this can be very broad, but I wanted to give you lots of room to go on with this. Um, what are some very common reptile care mistakes in the hobby and what should we do instead? For example, bearded dragon humidity, you did a video about that, leopard gecko substra substrates and frequent snake feedings. Uh, <laughs> there's so many you could yeah where to start <laughs> i know there really are um <laughs> like substrate passion is the most ridiculous thing i've ever encountered mm -hmm. dragons on leopard geckos they live on loose substrate wow you, you can literally look at videos of like dr jonathan howard who's beardy bit who literally has done like a massive study on taking blood samples of bearded dragons and the one who was out there he was do doing videos about the environment and stuff and he mm -hmm. literally can just pick up sand and pour it out of his hands and he did this thing where he analyzed it he sent some sand some soil off to a university and it came back at like 98 point something percent sand so bearded mm -hmm. dragons in the wild are living on sand so yeah sand isn't an issue with impaction the the issue is is that your husbandry is wrong and it's causing impactions to happen. Yeah. But the thing yeah. is, people get impactions even when they don't keep on substrate. If your beta dragon doesn't have enough vitamin D, that can cause an issue. N wrong temperature, they become immune suppressed and they can't get their immune system up to scratch. I mean, calcium means that if they're if 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 they have, don't have enough calcium, it means that they're very muscles inside them that allow peristalsis to occur to even like push things along they need calcium to contract so if you've mm -hmm. got an animal that's deficient in calcium then that's when they have trouble passing things there's just a layer of husbandry dehydration as well if they're mm -hmm. dehydrated which most bearded dragons in the world are suffering from because they're mm -hmm. trying to keep them with like 20 percent humidity <laughs> The, the urate plug is not lubricated inside on the feces and everything. It becomes this like desiccated mass, which is harder to pass. So mm -hmm. you think about everything being a dragon husbandry. It's people have different opinions on what temperature. Um, people don't really understand UV. People, yeah. so there's people saying they don't need water or humidity needs to be as low as possible. Literally everything about being a dragon husbandry is everything mm -hmm. that causes impactions. Yeah. literally all of it <laughs> i mean i mean there was absolutely like beardy vet said recently that in like almost all impactions with sand he sees, sees nearly all of them had underlying mbd mm -hmm. so it's not sand that's the issue it's what you're doing to the animal which is making basically messing up the animal which is causing things to go wrong right like if you can't open your leg and blood started coming out, you wouldn't go, oh, there's blood. Better take away my blood. You'd be like, no, don't cut yourself open. So to right. say, take away sand because sand gets blocked is, is, is just stupid. I mean, yeah. these animals in vet clinics, they're getting impacted on insect chitin anyway. Yeah. So impactions are occurring with the substrates there or not. So the, the substrate isn't causing the impaction. Your poor husbandry is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's yeah, there's so many of those and we kind of put you on the spot with just trying to name just one because there are so, so many and oh, it all, so I guess, does come fun. back to listening <clears throat> to science instead of like anecdotal evidence for reptile husbandry. Well, I mean, exactly. if someone can base an opinion based on science, then that I would take a listen and then go look at the science mm -hmm. yourself. I'm not asking yeah. people to, to listen to me blindly. I'm asking to watch the video and then go find what read the studies yourself and form your own opinion. And I bet mm -hmm. by the time you come back all round to it, you'll um, agree with what was in the video anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Nine times out of 10. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I made a video once where I said that uh, giving UVB to snakes will lead to, mitigating respiratory infections in snakes 
because the higher vitamin D levels will allow them to be at optimal vitamin D levels at all times, meaning yeah. that their immune system is at like tip top condition. And then mm -hmm. plus there's virucidal and bactericidal properties to UV light. <clears throat> of course, that is not going to replace cleaning and disinfection, right. but it's going to be like marginal help. So it's not going to stop the thing occurring in the first place, but just by having it there is better than it not being there. And the vitamin D thing is the main thing. But I made mm -hmm. that I made that video based on hu human studies. It goes, this may be the case. And then um, some people didn't like it. And then it came up later on down the line that there's studies happening around how around it now, linking it a bit higher vitamin D through synthesis to uh, to mitigating respiratory infections so it's slightly yeah. ironic that i was there before it <laughs> kicked off <laughs> but, but yeah. yeah it happens uh-huh um so one of your more popular and probably most shared videos is your video about self-regulation of the reptile hobby excuse me hobby and you spoke about the need for us to in specific shift from like the large scale breeders who are just trying to make money to the smaller scale small batch breeders who actually have the best animals interest in mind. Can you kind of like restate that for anyone who hasn't seen that video? Because I think it is such an important thing that we need to learn more about. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> such a every single question. I'm like, oh, where do I start? Um, well, the problem is, is that of course, not every person who's mass producing animals um, is necessarily doing the worst thing possible. But mm -hmm. the, there is a lot of it where it's just about profit. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go to, and they they cannot operate keeping to a good welfare standard, and, ma and making profit. But the thing is, I don't know if you saw what is it? US Ark. They had mm -hmm. a. Um, they said that the one percent of these breeders are supplying the ninety nine percent of pet keepers. So it's the 1% supplying the 99% with animals. Mm -hmm. So, and there's this whole thing about, oh, you can't ask them to upgrade because the price will, the price will um, go up. But if the hobby focused on supporting small batch, mm -hmm. then one, they're not producing that amount of animals. So they can be happier with a smaller profit margin, they can keep to a higher standard if they want to. I mean, not everyone breeding is doing it to make to make millions. There's people who can do it full time at a high standard and still make good money. It's just the fact mm -hmm. that they're not making millions. They're just there's a livelihood, and then there's millions. Most, you have yeah, to make worth the sacrifices to become that to make that amount of money at the top. But you don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to buy from everyone at the top. And it's like, well, yeah, but everyone's going to be expensive. Well, if you culturally got on to small batch and, and emphasizing the importance of welfare and good quality animals, then eventually prices will come down because that's how the market works. Right. But I, I could go into as, as loads. I mean, like even talking about like a, like a hatchling that starts off in a, a complex environment compared to one that's in a sterile environment that has a ma massive impact on its cognitive the development, which means that if you paid more for the one that was raised in a complex environment, it would be a better pet because it'd be better outgoing, more outgoing. A number like it's, there's so yeah. much to get into. I, I couldn't even fathom how to answer it in one cut and go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most definitely. And it seems like the more this conversation is being had, the more good ideas are being, are being brought to the table. But like, in my opinion, I am most definitely willing to pay 20% more for a reptile if it means that they've been raised by someone who has paid special attention to this baby bearded dragon, just using that as an example, compared to one that's been, it just has a piece of, or a little spot of nail polish on its tail. So we know which one it is so that they're sitting in the right one, but they haven't interacted with it. They don't know if it's actually eating stuff like that. Like I would much rather pay a little more to get a healthier individual because that's going to save you money on vet bills and things like that in the long run. Speaking of that, 
I mean, one practice that I want to start doing is mm -hmm. you like the test for crypto crypto spiridium um, mm -hmm. is like twenty pounds, right? Yeah. Me. So if I were to test a baby for crypto, it comes back negative. I'll add twenty pounds onto the price of the animal. That means when the person buys the animal, they buy it with knowing that it's got a negative result, which means they aren't buying an animal, having to pay that twenty pounds to test it, and then realizing what. Let's say it comes back positive, then you're stuck with that animal. Yeah, it's the same price to test, but then you aren't stuck with something that turns out positive. Whereas if you mm -hmm. if you pay the extra bit in advance and you know what's come towards you has a negative test, then you're more likely to not be stuck with something that's positive that may end up having to be euthanized. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how many breeders actually giving you money back? I know, I, I, I was going to say I know things, but I know, I know breeders that are spreading things like wild and no one says a word because everyone's worried about reputation, but mm -hmm. I, I know there's certain, especially in the US, there's a lot going around. Yeah. And there was a certain, Absolutely. like, not to like name anyone, but there was a certain like reptile breeder who, sent out a bunch of snakes i think they had nidovirus recently and like refused to give any refunds they're like that must have come from your collection and someone was like well there is not a single other snake in my home so no but then they went on their soapbox instead of owning up to it and being like i'm so sorry here's your money back things like that it's yeah it's very disappointing there's a system they do in Absolutely. like rats where generally they have the, they have their racks they will move substrates and stuff into yeah. like this end this end rack so that media goes from this side to this side and then to save money they test this one the animals in this one rack in the end so they know if this one animal at the end keeps coming back negative then they know the entire rack is um is negative as well because mm. all the subs all the media has come through it all so mm -hmm. this one at the end bless it becomes the guinea pig meaning that you could potentially give it something that it didn't have before but it's a right. cheaper way to test because you've you've essentially passed everything down through it all. So you know that by this end one, if it keeps coming back negative and you, you're constantly making that the guinea pig, then you know you haven't got anything. Yeah. But I, I don't know anyone that, that does employs that practice from rodents to reptiles mm -hmm. to, to make to, right. to be saying they're actually testing as a breeder. It's a free for all, especially in the yeah. US as well. Uh huh. Yeah, and especially I definitely like, like that idea of testing. It's a bit harsh mm -hmm. on the end animal, but right. welfare-wise, it means that animals aren't going out positive and end up being euthanized. So, yeah, in the end, very it will utilitarian save. approach where the the lesser evil, I suppose. Uh huh. For sure. I'm just gonna check the chat real quick because there are a lot of messages that we haven't set or seen. But I just want to say <laughs> hello to everyone. Looks like we have a question. So Dixon says, Liam, you mentioned substrate, something I know you have done a video on. Microbial acquisition for herbivores was not mentioned in that video, though. Could you talk a little more about the importance of that? No, because I haven't researched okay. it. <laughs> okay. So I'm not that... going to uh, make up on the spot because I, I haven't researched that. So not going to lie. <laughs> that would be creating good. the problem trying to you... fight. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad exactly. that you said There's that because there are... That exact. Uh -huh. There are a lot yeah, of things like... there's a lot of like, that exact issues. People just... Yeah, people yeah. want... People are afraid of saying no Sorry. if they don't know the answer. That's the thing with YouTube. People put pressure on themselves to to come across as an expert. So they will yeah. end up making videos talking absolute nonsense because they're trying to, to be something they're not. When it actually is... For, I think it's far more admirable to just say, I don't know. Absolutely. When you know... If they know the answer, you know they researched it then. And they say, I don't yeah. know. You're like, fair enough. Yeah. Most definitely. That's the approach like, I'm taking anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great because that does make you a lot more reliable. We know if you're talking about something, it's something that you actually know what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm mean, I just it's it's hard. I know it is. I know mm -hmm. like Taylor Dean Nicole said when in her coming back video, that was the thing she struggled with most. And mm. she said, Oh, now that I'm back, I'm just gonna show my hobby and not give advice i'm just saying this is just what i'm doing i'm just mm -hmm. experience my hobby through me but i'm not going to yeah. give advice i mean if you don't know what you're on about if that sounds if you don't want to create that pressure on yourself you don't have to give advice on youtube not every video has to be educational right. mm -hmm. absolutely i really I mean, like that way that. of thinking 
no, you can't fault someone for saying I don't know. Right. Yeah, for real. Like I feel like a lot of people just haven't learned that yet or don't understand that it's okay to say I don't know if you don't know the answer to a question. Because I get questions from people all the time. Like I'll get messages from subscribers and keep telling me about this animal. I was like, I've never even searched the name of that animal in like scholar or anything in my life. So no, I know nothing about that animal. So yeah, I, I said, here's the link to scholar with it searched in, have a troll through the papers, but I haven't done it. So can't advise you. Uh huh. And then someone here sharing their experience in Australia. Um, they say so true water, vitamin D3 and temper. So often the issue with beardies, Australia isn't nearly as dry as people think. We had floods several places I lived. It's 50 plus Celsius in the shade and you burn in 10 minutes. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people don't know how to use weather.com and type in the location where they live and see, oh, my information that I'm getting is not right. It's, it's very hard. I mean, I'm doing... Do you know about my Bearded Dragon project? Yes. So I am completely scrapping my care half of and starting again really i've I, in like in the week from starting this i'm collecting every single study on bearded dragons that has ever existed wow i've learned so much that i'm just gonna scrap what i'm doing and do things completely differently like yeah literally every single aspect of my care i'm i'm basically starting again that's that, <laughs> that's yeah. ridiculous but it seems like the more we learn about bearded dragons the more is changing for their captive management. So I'm excited to see that video when you do put it up. Yeah, it's going to be very difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Back to that question. Um, mm -hmm. Beard of dragons in the wild are bi biphasic, which means they bask in the morning and the evening. They don't bask yeah. at the hottest part of the day. So it might get up to, like, it's, this is purely going off of re uh, uh, research and beardy vet here. Um, mm -hmm. They might go up to like 10 a.m. and they'll come out um, in spring and they'll bask at like a UVI of like four on average. This is what Beardy Vet found in his study. Um, and then as soon as it like ramps up to midday where the UVI is like 11 and it's like baking hot, the bearded dragons are gone. They're in the shade or they're under a log or they're not in the sun. And then when it cools down yeah. again, they might come back out again. But it's important that you need to understand the uh, animal, because if you go and look at weather data and say, oh, it's a UVI of 11 during the day, and then you give a bearded dragon a UVI of 11, well, hello, cancer. Because yeah. that is not what a bearded dragon was built to be under. True. So yeah, you that's really, really interesting. You really need to go into a deep dive. Mm -hmm. it's and it's really yeah. hard to even replicate that biphasic basking. The way we do it in captivity now is if you've got a proper basket spot over and out like four, you give that as soon as the lights come on. To, there's no way to like dial up and down a UV fluorescent, so it's on. Right. That would off. shatter it. So you've literally got the same UVI throughout the day. So, mm -hmm. yes, it's their preferred basking UVI throughout the day, but you aren't getting that biphasic pattern that they would exhibit in the wild. So it's it's difficult. You would need. Is it, I was. I've been thinking about this since I've been doing my research. Should I do it for the video? You oh. would need two UVI uh, UV bulbs. I would need one that got to like a UVI of two at like a mm -hmm. certain distance. I set, and then the other one that's like the four UVI. Mm -hmm. But when they both come on together, they'll add up to like seven or something. Yeah. So. So the, the, the first one comes on in the morning, where it's, to, it's like 2. Because in the summer, they estivate. So they might come mm -hmm. out at like 8 a.m. and bask at like a UVI 2. And that's all they do for the day in the summer, because it's like peak hot. Yeah. So I could, you could do that, get that to come on. And then that one goes off and the, the UVI 4 comes on, which replicates that one during spring they select for the UVI mm. 4. And then you have them both come on again to create that peak to let them go away again. And then you scale it backwards during the evening so it creates that two-pronged basking throughout the day. But who, who is doing that at the moment? Like, No one. <laughs> you can do that it. Be, right. Yeah, I've never and heard I'm of anyone do it. doing that. I think you should definitely do that for a video because that would be really interesting. And especially if you were able to use like, let's see, where do I have them? If 
you know what I mean by like these Wi-Fi plugins and stuff. You can do these so that it turns on and off at a specific time. You could create that biphasic basking cycle, and that would be really interesting. Yeah, if you really plan it out with timers and the lot, you can get you can get it right. It's money at the yeah. end of the day. It's, it's a struggle to get people to just provide the right UV UV from one bulb or the right bat. Still, people <laughs> bearded dragon ceramics. You know, oh my god. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's even with feeding. I, I I'm scrapping a lot and starting again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like from like I haven't done a ton of research from like scholarly articles or anything in bearded dragons, but it seems like when I do do that type of research, we're feeding them very wrong in captivity like way too much and way too often way too much way mm-hmm. too much like the average and that's why yeah the average female bearded dragon in the world is 250 grams yeah how many bearded dragons at yeah. that weight in captivity <laughs> <laughs> even lie. my own my There's own is overweight by that yeah. standard my, my female bearded dragon is 360 grams overweight my, well, my, my right thinking now. was my thinking was she's got adenovirus so she, is it mm-hmm. better for her to have a little bit more on her so if she goes sideways um right and she doesn't eat for a while she's got some storage on her or mm-hmm. from what i've learned now the less grams on them the easier it is for them to get up to their optimum temperature because there's less grams to heat which is why oh. you see massive obese bearded dragons sitting under the bulb all day because they've got so mm-hmm. much to get up to temperature whereas if you keep them lean then they can warm up more efficiently so now i'm like oh okay so i should reduce her weight so her immune system is a peak top condition because she's got less grams on her which means she heats up more efficiently yeah so where is this information in the hobby nowhere yeah for real yeah people are so afraid (laughs) that their beauty is going to lose weight during makes sense yeah Uh so when this video comes out it's either going to blow everyone's minds or bore it from <laughs> death. <laughs> one or two. <laughs> There's no in between. <laughs> bored to death. Or maybe a 50 fix, 50 mix, depending on who's watching. But hopefully people will see that information and choose to take it and learn from it. I, I really ha- hope that it, the video does well because it's like nothing like that has ever been done before. No, there's not even yeah. a paper that has done like a systematic review of information so far. So I'll be doing what no one's even done in academia for a youtube video so if it doesn't do well on youtube i don't know what else to do because <laughs> can't get right. more any any more original than that <laughs> yeah for sure that's going to be exciting and yeah, i guess I so. gracie if you want to move us on to our next topic because we could go on that forever <laughs> yeah <laughs> it'll be really good uh, yeah um so <laughs> do you ever have any interest in keeping species of amphibians at all Yes. Um, a reason I don't is I just don't want them singing at night. That's that's the only oh. reason, really. <laughs> yeah. I really I like European that. tree frogs. Um, mm. What is tree frogs? I've got an axolotl. Oh, well, I say I do. The family has an axolotl in the living room downstairs, but okay. Um, I don't really get involved in that husbandry because I just don't get involved. If it's not mine, I don't. I obsess over my own animal's husbandry, and if it's not mine, I just don't get involved. Yeah. Too much clashing heads that. and stuff. Fair enough. Can't Uh uh-huh yeah i feel like the noise thing definitely is a factor because i have a male white tree frog in upstairs on the opposite end of the house and i'm downstairs on the opposite end of the house and i can hear him sometimes i can imagine but they are cool to keep though at london Uh zoo they've got this big enclosure where it's like these tin walls and there's like a sink and a mirror and a toilet it's like an outdoor (laughs) outdoor australian um dunny because yeah. in, in Australia, apparently, they're really common to find in your outhouse toilets. So they've yeah. got the sink running, um, <laughs> and it like fills up, but it drains away into like, this bucket thing, and it loops back around <laughs> again. So it's got this, it's, it's just really cool setup. That's like an awesome. entire room. That sounds frogs. awesome. You could walk into it. <laughs> oh, wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah it's, seen... It is a room. Wow. Yeah, I've seen so many photos of them in people's bathrooms or like their outhouses really in Australia. And it's so funny. They like to hang out under toilet seats and such. Yeah. <laughs> Same with final <laughs> So <laughs> I know we spoke in, I think on Messenger about there are some regulations about breeding and selling reptiles in the UK, like 
if you make a certain amount, you have to get a certain permit. Can you kind of explain that to us, how it works? So if you earn, if you make over a thousand pounds a year, you're supposed to get a pet shop license. Okay. Um, supposed to, people don't. Right. But technically you're supposed to. Um, the whole thing, I mean, even in America, the whole thing with breeding reptiles is why everyone's so mad and having these bedrooms full of racks is because you're hiding money away from Mr. Taxman because he doesn't see it, yeah. does he? So if they don't know what you're up to, then these people might make like 10 grand extra a year and non-taxed. So, But yeah, you're supposed yeah. to, if you make over a thousand pounds a year, um, apply for a pet shop license. But people don't do that. I mean, people, even... I even even me, I'll, I'll be honest. Like I breed my Mexican like king snakes once to sell mm -hmm. all those babies will be over a thousand pounds, but I'm I'm not going to apply for a right. pet shop license just to sell one clutch. For sure, like, it's just I I think either it needs to be readjusted or the the, the price needs to be um, readjusted. Because mm -hmm. the whole point yeah. is that it stops people from doing it as a business um, compared to people that are just breeding for a hobby. I but, see. I'm breeding for a hobby, but by producing one clutch, I tend to mm -hmm. tip over that. So it's like, yeah, one clutch shops, could bring triple yeah, exactly. that amount. Pet shops have the animals activities license, which states the minimum closure sizes and stuff. Okay. So for snakes and pet shops, it's uh, two thirds the length of the snake long and one third deep and height isn't specified. But I, okay. I know that that's going up as well. There's a lot of things mm. going on in the UK, which I'm I'm quite happy with. Yeah, that's exciting. I know, like you probably can't speak about a lot of it publicly until that. I can't actually... say the things that I've told you privately. No. <laughs> right. Yeah. No worries. But I guess to anyone watching, no big things are happening, and it should be good for the animals, which is the most important thing. Yeah. I think we definitely need a system of regulation like that in the U S because there are so many people who do keep snakes in absolutely abhorrent conditions and they're making 30, $40,000 a year just off of their snake breeding business. Cause they can line an entire wall with them and keep ball pythons in a little shoe box with a water dish and that's it. And it's very disappointing to see. I mean, I, I can understand why they do it. I mean, who doesn't want to have their entire living being just keeping reptiles? Right. But the, I'll be honest, one of the reasons I started a YouTube channel as well is to make money from reptiles, but in a way that doesn't negatively impact an animal's welfare. Mm -hmm. So I was, ne I was never going to let myself go down that rack route, but this was the way that I would allow myself to make money, but not negatively impact animals, but positively impact them. We'll yeah, try to that's anyway. awesome. <laughs> uh -huh. And I guess now it is random discussion time. So first, let's look in the chat and see, like, are there any topics that people have brought up? Because, hmm, let's see here. Someone says, good evening, friends, scientists, new keepers, and zoologists, and futurists. They really covered all the bases. <laughs> Hello. Thank you to everyone who's watching. I really did. Um, let's see here. I'm not seeing any, like, specific topics. Liam, are there anything in particular that you would like to talk about? Uh, <laughs> I'll keep you for hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm, not off the top of my head. I'm actually just start ranting, but then I just start <laughs> rambling like a madman. <laughs> it's so oh, funny. Feel, you, yeah. When you think about reptiles, you have all this stuff pinging around your head. But when you make a video, you can construct a <laughs> script and you can make the madness in your head makes sense but when mm -hmm. you think about a million things at once like live you, oh, yeah. you just like blah 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 blah, blah. and that's what <laughs> the thing is with, with with people like vets and stuff you ask them questions and you watch them hesitate and pause and think mm -hmm. and that's the difference between someone that doesn't want to talk and i mean my friend my friend francis said this to me that pointed mm -hmm. out to me i didn't think he said that that's the difference between the people that don't know what they're talking about by talking absolutes because they think they know everything between and then there's someone that talks hesitantly pausing and thinking about what they want to say because they don't mm -hmm. want to talk in absolutes because they know that not everything is known 
So, yeah. and that's the danger because it's very attractive when someone talks in absolute confidence and you go, oh, this person must know what they're doing. I mean, I, mm. a lot of the large channels, I must admit, I, I've watched some of them. I'm like, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Like that is the complete opposite of like, like a detailed <laughs> list of studies have found, but that is what is attractive. Like if you talk in absolute confidence, then that inspires people to trust you. Whereas if you if you're hesitant to answer a question, or it makes you seem like you don't know what you're talking about to some people, when in actuality it's more caution because you know that words wrongly can do more damage than good, and that's how myths Absolutely. start. And that's why I straight mm-hmm. up said no, because I'm not answering it. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. Natasha Peterson asks, do any of you train your reptiles, like, for example, using the Lori Torini method? I have yeah. been doing a deep dive in her videos, and I'm excited to start. Uh, I did a collaboration with Lori where I trained, uh, target trained my snake and then sent the session yeah. to her, and then she gave me pointers. So I don't know if you've seen that. Well... If anyone's mm-hmm. never seen my channel before, go ahead and have a look at that because that's quite an old video. But yeah, I do train my snakes. Yeah, I don't do it as regularly as I should, but I, I do dabble. Go follow mm-hmm. Liam. <laughs> yeah, for anyone who hasn't subscribed to Liam for whatever reason, it is one of the top links in the chat. Yeah, it's on the second line of the chat. Just click on reptiles and research, and you can go subscribe right there. My but... sales pitch is: you can send, you can spend four months researching and finding every study that ever existed or you can just subscribe and let me do it for you <laughs> yep there <you> are. <laughs> i like that i think i'll subscribe and let you do that <laughs> <laughs> the critter dude i like that name asks what are some tips for being successful on youtube well if we um, knew that we'd be there <laughs> right yeah exactly if i knew that i would be I would own my own zoo right now too. <laughs> I mean, I, I did make a video about some Absolutely. basic yeah. algorithmic stuff on YouTube. So I made a video about how to grow a reptile channel about some talking about mm-hmm. what click through rate means and retention. So it's a good start for someone that wants to understand how YouTube works, but mm-hmm. by no means do I have all the answers. I, I basically say in that video, there's a, there's a tool that I use that I recommend that makes your life a lot easier. So go find that. But for the most part, I just say be cautious about what you're saying like i said you don't have to know the answers it's okay to say i don't know and it's okay to have a channel just sharing your experiences with your hobby you don't have to be giving advice yeah absolutely and sometimes those are very fun video um excuse me videos to watch too because you can just watch someone feed their reptiles for 45 minutes and it's like relaxing and or sometimes i like to put a video on in the background while i'm feeding my reptiles and if it's just like a calm, low-key video. That's always fun too. Yeah, people do that with my study read longs. Treat it like a yeah, podcast. Yeah, I always... Yeah, I didn't anticipate people doing that. Yeah, I always play them in the background while I'm doing that because for some reason I retain information better when I'm like doing 30 things at once. <laughs> yeah, because you have a memory and you associate what you're doing at that time with that information. Mm-hmm. I do that. Yeah. Yeah, and then since I like to do reptile stuff while I'm learning about reptiles in my AirPods, I guess, because then when I'm doing it, I remember the information. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But yeah, like my, to answer the question, my biggest, my biggest advice would just be meet and talk to as many other people who are doing what you want to be doing, because everyone has a little piece of advice they can share with you and it's all going to be helpful. I mean, says... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I'm quite poor for that, to be fair. There's, there's, there's some critters that I wouldn't go near with a 10-foot pole, but... <laughs> True. <laughs> some of it, yeah. yeah. There's good ones that I, I will seek out if I think they're good. Yeah. Try, I guess, like, try to build community with creators who you look up to, not just, like, anyone who you think... Will get is... your views. Right. Yeah, exactly. Definitely decide um... who you don't want to associate with, too, because in the reptile community... That's just as important, quite frankly. Yeah, I mean, I started, when I first started, I started a Facebook group with channels that I, like, picked out. Um, and I got them all talking. Okay. Um, people, like Animals at Home, JTB Reptiles, Lori Torini. Mm-hmm. Um, do you know Repti Files? Yeah, Mariah. Um, she's awesome. She, I, she didn't actually start a channel, I don't think. But she's been uh, doing a lot of blogging stuff, I think. Um mm-hmm like Celtic reptile amphibians, you know them? 
Yeah, they're awesome. Um, uh, I was just trying to get people collaborating and talking that are actually like evidence based because it seems like you're you're in a sea all by your own on a little raft trying to do good, <laughs> whereas all the uh, poor things are uh, all linked up collaborating. It seems. Uh huh. Yeah. Definitely. Fight Someone the says. Uh huh. I clicker trained my dragons at feeding times and tapped trained my leopard gecko. I tap a rock with uh, tongs and he comes out of his cave for food. So it's definitely doable. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people think like reptiles are simple minded or stuff, but they definitely aren't. You can just find a way that works for you to train them to do something. It's good for them and it's good for you. I mean, my next video is um, along those lines with my collaboration with Laurie. Okay. About brain, brain structure and reptile emotion. And yeah all that stuff i'm not gonna give it away you're gonna have to go have a look <laughs> yeah everyone go subscribe to <laughs> liam's channel seriously because that's gonna be awesome i do something similar with my leopard geckos they know i like kind of click the tongs together and they know okay i hear that sound it's food time because my leopard gecko pippin she's a blizzard and they're known for having like big appetites and if i didn't do that she would go for my fingers <laughs> yeah and then you translate I do that something very snakes. similar with mine. Yeah. Yeah. For some reason in my brain, it's so funny whenever someone says like king snakes with their big appetites because my foster king snake, he's brewmating now, but he has absolutely no food interest, which is why he's with me instead of his original owner. Mine are all in the uh, the fridge down down there. I look at this backwards. Down in the little incubator there. The oh, incubator I see. goes reverse as well, so I can call and he so they're like 12 uh, 11 degrees at the moment so that's okay fine. so that's like 51 52 fahrenheit for any american listeners oh i can't do fahrenheit <laughs> Thank you for that. i know it's so i don't know celsius makes a lot more sense not to me but like generally looking at it i'm like why don't we just switch to that because it's a lot more reasonable, but well, whatever. it's like freezing is zero, fr freezing point is zero, and boiling point is a hundred. Like, yeah, there's so, boundaries that make sense. What yeah, is it? In, exactly. So what's what's freezing in Fahrenheit? Thirty-one. Why? <laughs> Why would because, you say thirty-one? <laughs> I don't know. And boiling is two hundred twelve no because in a f mile is five thousand two hundred eighty, I think, feet. So we need to switch to metric because that would be a lot easier. <laughs> I mean, the UK isn't fully metric. We have like miles instead of kilometers and stuff. So oh, we're going off track here, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Someone says, "Oh, their sand boa is trained. That's cool. Sand boas are cool. I love sand boas." That would make yeah. Me too. That sounds perfect. Yeah. Um. Let's see here. There is a veterinarian named Sean McCormick who has clicker trained his frogs, apparently. I need to put that in my notes to check that out because that sounds very fascinating. Well, that makes sense. They, they all, the amphibians both have the amygdala and the hippocampus, so the, the ability to do all that is, is there. Emotions. Emotions are created in the amygdala, and then every single vertebrate has it. So, yeah. say reptiles don't have emotions, <laughs> you need to yeah. learn your brain anatomy. <laughs> yeah, for real. Yeah, that's always that's another topic because I will send that video to I you. Work under. <laughs> One of the vets I work under has been working on training her tortoises different oh. behaviors, and it's been very interesting. She brought him in the other day and was showing me some of the stuff she's working on. That's so cool. Oh, it's very that's cool. What tortoises does keepers. she have? She has a red foot and a sulcata. Cool. Love a good red foot. Uh huh. In I'm not sure if any of you guys have read M from Emzotic, um, Emma Locke's book, Animal Kind. She, it's like stories based on true stories of people who keep animals. And one of them is a tortoise. I believe his name is Bubbles. And I can't remember the species because it's been a long time since I read the book. But he just knows like some, I think teaching him how to shake was one of the first things they did. But it wasn't on purpose, but that was like one of the fun things from that book. So it's interesting when people do train tortoises because they're very intelligent and I feel like they don't get, just reptiles in general don't get enough credit. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, oh. Zoe has trained her wood and blendings turtles at work, and the snapper is a work in progress. Nice. What makes me laugh is that there's people that will say, oh, you can't train reptiles, but then they'll like talk about hook training. Right. And it's like, you <laughs> yeah. that's still a prone conditioning. You've made them yeah. associate the negative experience of being tapped by a hook so that they realize that they need to back up. But mm -hmm. when you reverse that to positive stimulation, um, like rewards, so suddenly the people are like, oh, they can't be trained. It's like you, you, you've just <laughs> already acknowledged that operant conditioning exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, uh, there's just a lack of crit critical thinking in the hobby in general. Yeah, very much so. It, yeah, it brings it back to the echo chamber of someone said something and then someone else said the same thing and now 30,000 people have said it and no one wants to listen yeah. to the real information. <laughs> Do you remember, did you ever see that video on um, Animals at Home where I debated a rat keeper? <laughs> oh, no, actually, I have not. I need to go watch that. That um, She ended up just agreeing with me. And I was like, this isn't really a debate, is it? This is, it, was, it made it harder because all she did was just agree. And I was just like, okay. But there was there a regional guy that was supposed to do it that was like, you know, the hardcore, I've been keeping 30 years. All, all they need is water and food and it didn't even keep them warm to get my room temperature. So he was one oh, of them and he was going to do it. And I was like, I'm going to spin you around in circles. And then the last minute he backed out. I was like, oh. <laughs> it was, oh. is it like publicly announced or like the name of who that person was? Uh, it was in v Facebook groups. So okay. not on the channel, but it right. was on Facebook groups and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Those... Mean, and then afterwards made up excuses, but yeah. Yeah. Those keepers, they cracks me up because they just, I don't know why you would purposefully defend saying like, it's bad to go above and beyond. Like I can almost understand it when people are like, well, they have everything they need, but I cannot understand when people are like giving them more than they need is just stressing them out. Or like the, that enclosure is far too big. I'm like, because you're one to speak. <laughs> if you acknowledge that, what they're doing is not good enough, then eventually the hobby moves on and then eventually legislation moves on and stops them doing what they're doing. And the the profit margins they're making at the moment or the way they're making money at the moment goes out the window. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about longevity of keeping what they're doing surviving, uh, keeping mm -hmm. that alive rather than what's better for the animal. Whereas I I, I've got nothing to lose. I've got what a bearded dragon and a couple of king steaks. So mm -hmm. I'm not exactly <laughs> making money about saying they need bigger stuff. It's costing me money to keep up with what I'm saying. Yeah, for real. Here I am. I'm like everything I say, barely covering I my costs. Everything I say to do, I will do myself. Like so, mm -hmm. with this bearded dragon thing, I'm gonna do upgrades, like as long as information comes out in this video. So, Adam, ugh, this bearded dragon is gonna have one, two, three, four, four bulbs in the in the tank. Um, and then I'm debating doing that biophasic thing by getting another tower and loads of timers. So, God yeah, if I'll do that, it'll cost me loads. Yeah, for real. But yeah, I'm glad that you are making that video because, like I said, it's going to be super interesting to see what information you do bring to light because I feel like there's a lot that, not that people don't know about bearded dragons, but just no one has put it into terms that the average pet keeper can understand. So, I'm excited to see that. Yeah, and I chose to start this whilst the bit of Dragon the Brumation, so <laughs> God knows when it's gonna <laughs> gonna actually come to fruition because I need be roll. So I want to wake her up, but right, who knows how long it'll take me? It's gonna it's taken me months of work to even just collect the studies, let alone read them. Because I'm not just as I'm not just collecting them. I'm literally collecting over like 200 studies or something so far, and I'm going through each study, reading them with a word document. And like making like the like I do my study read alongs, so I'm going mm -hmm. that level of scrutiny every single one for like 200 yeah. studies, and then trying wow. to craft it into a story and make it <laughs> digestible all at once. This <laughs> is, uh <-huh. laughs> yeah, I was picking my be, belly. <laughs> is it going to be one video or like a playlist of videos, or how are you going to make that? My idea at the moment it? is one big video. Okay, just one big. You watch okay. this, and it's just everything like open the floodgates <laughs> right 
I think that'll be good because all that information there in once someone can sit down and watch it or they could pause it and go take a break and come back and watch the rest of it or however, but that way it's there in front of them. Well, it comes into a little bit of a YouTube strategy as well. I'm thinking about like rewatchability as well. If it's one video, mm-hmm. people come back to watch it when they want to like go back yeah. to that bit. Of, and then we've got, what is it? We've got chapters now. So chapters uh-huh. can rank and search. So if people yeah. are searching for individual thing, I can make an individual video or I can just categorize sections in the video and label chapters. So that chapter comes up and search. So people watch that video over and over and over again. So eventually that video, like Bit of Dragons, is just everywhere. That's my theory anyway. Nothing ever works. <laughs> yeah. From what I've heard, if someone does search for a chapter and then they just watch the chapter and then click off, it's not going to hurt the retention of the rest of the video. It's just going to boost the retention of that specific part of the really? video. So that's, I did not know that, that. I had seen that in like maybe the Annie Dubay Facebook group. So who knows? But that's what I had heard, and I'm excited for that. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that then. Yeah, for real, because uh-huh. retention is my main nightmare that I'm thinking of. Oh, so, yeah. But I'm I gonna have that. like interviews with people. Um, it's gonna. I'm gonna try and like move at a really fast pace, just keep mm-hmm. engaging. But I'm sure people are bored yeah. of talking about retention. The people that actually right. aren't actually into YouTube and just reptiles, <laughs> but yeah. Someone asks, does do Gracie and reptiles and research have YouTube channels? Yes, they do. They are both linked in the description if you're watching this on youtube go yeah reptiles and research and then efg <laughs> exotics they're both linked right there so go check them out oh i've, I've gone to the stage where if you google it it comes up in google so yeah yeah just type them yeah. into google and they'll come up yeah it's in the forefoot because i can't i don't have I physically don't have the space if I, this is the only space i have to keep so if mm-hmm. i even made it like five foot then the vivid would come up to here so there would be like a gap here. So the, the walkway in this room would be like, impact. so yeah, it's going to have to be trying to make it um, as complex as an environment as possible with like in trying to increase surface area, but not actually increasing uh-huh. the bit. But I do a lot of free roaming as well. So I've got like a little, got a little beardy ramp. So that's oh. the ramp. And then this bit, I will leave on the edge of the, on the, of the glass oh. runners and then, she can just come and go. But she awesome. did learn to where her basket spot was. So she would come out, run around and stuff, and go back and bask and come out and run around again. Nice. So I've, she, she she is getting to come out. So I mm-hmm. do want to do a massive upgrade. Because the, the, these are semi-boreal animals. Semi-boreal mm-hmm. animals. So in, they should be in like something a bit taller. So I would love something like a six by by two by four or something, or six by two by six. Like give them that height. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if you've ever mm-hmm. seen them in the, like the wild. Like, there, there's pictures of bearded dragons like up top of top of a tree. Yeah. So, to say uh-huh. like they 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 can't have more than two foot. Uh, yeah, it's difficult. Uh huh. Yeah, and like they, that also brings anyone. in anyone. Sorry, mm-hmm. go ahead. Oh, that also brings in like that's a great way to offer them a variety of UV indexes. If you have different heights, they can get closer to the uv or farther from it they know what they need they're gonna climb if they need to to get what they need so things like that the the idea that i have in my head is that one corner is like a square basking spot and then Mm. you have like the high uv like uvi four to five or whatever and a high basking surface temperature and on the Mm. underside of that wood you've got things mounted to the bottom of it so then you have a lower Basking surface, um, a lower, oh, okay. so if I low and a high, so the option to bask at a low UVI or a high UVI, mm-hmm. um, there's just ways that you can be creative and giving them options. So awesome. that's what I would like to try. That's going to be fascinating. But then, I, even me, I'm really um, excited to see that. It, it's okay to know what specific animal and like think in your head, I'm working towards that. I mean, mm-hmm. I can't give her the height I want to, but I know that it's a uh, you still have to acknowledge what's best for the animal. Mm-hmm. Just no point in just saying, oh, that, that's not true just because you can't provide it yet. Just acknowledge right. it and know that you're working towards it. And you can't mm-hmm. really fault someone that knows what's best for the animal and they want to do that. They just can't do it at the moment. And I'm finding right. that limitation myself. So mm-hmm. it's very grassroots, my channel. <laughs> yeah. But that's how it seems like that's how every good thing starts grassroots. So yeah. 
Yeah, Someone asked, crossed. does showing the face behind the camera make a difference to a YouTube channel? I mean, Rebecca from Leopard Gecko, she doesn't show her face and she has hundreds of thousands of subscribers. So I'd say if you want to make a channel where you don't show your face, go for it. I th I have noticed a massive difference to retention since I went on camera. So when I first mm -hmm. started, I wasn't on camera. Oh. But it's, you, you think about the issue is when you're not on camera, you have to find all this B roll. Uh huh. Thing is, if you you've got on camera, you can find loads of B roll to keep it interesting. But those gaps where well, you don't have B roll, it's just your face. But your face mm -hmm. is engaging enough to carry that across. Whereas if you don't right. have B roll when you're not on camera, it's just black. So you have to have B roll for it to be something on the screen. Yeah, and I've even I used found, to like, struggle a lot. Uh huh. For like an hour. Well, like when I'm on camera filming, like just right now, I talk with my hands a lot. And then for like an hour or two after I'm done filming, if I go like upstairs to talk to someone, I'm still talking with my hands and I don't do that normally. So it's like, I've learned, like, I have to keep the audience engaged. And so like, I think if we are still using Rebecca as an example, she does a great job of keeping us engaged. Lots of clips of her leopard geckos doing stuff. But for me, I am terrible at shooting B-roll. So I have to show myself or else there would be nothing interesting. <laughs> yeah. Don't go six foot tall. It's been an absolute nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, is that with the um, the Aussie water dragons? Oh, he's one of one of my uh, patrons. Oh, I see. Ooh. Cool. I'm glad people came across from my side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exciting. It's always great when we can mesh like two communities <laughs> of different reptile. Great. Yeah. Um, let's see here. It looks like we should probably wrap this up soon, but does anyone in the chat, like you can see, ask us any questions that you have in the chat. Now is your chance. Um, also Liam, do you have any topics that you want to talk about before we go or Gracie? Uh, nothing on mind. Okay. For once. <laughs> no, I feel that it seems like I have a billion ideas in my head until there are actually people watching live and then I'm like, well, now I need to think of what we should talk about. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, um, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you ask me questions, I'll, I'll probably run my mouth forever, but at the moment, <laughs> nothing comes to mind. Right. So oh, I guess while we're waiting I for did... some more... Oh, go ahead, Gracie. <laughs> Sorry. No, um, you're good. I go do want to ask you what kind of sparked your interest in reptiles specifically i know some people kind of have like a whole story but is there anything you remember that kind of sparked reptiles specifically yeah. for you yeah i mean always had an interest in animals been a bit obsessed um i always used to be obsessed with steve Irwin, but not necessarily because of animal of reptiles for some reason when i was younger i didn't really click that it was all about reptiles mm. but um it's only been recently that I, I, I like to keep myself in a zoo. You have so many limitations put on you where you have to like fill out forms if you want to change the substrate or when you, you're keeping yourself, you are the curator, you are the keeper, you are the owner. Um, and reptiles are the, the most exotic thing you can keep in your own home, I suppose. I mean, uh -huh. if there was like these miniature tigers about this big or something that you could stick in a vid, <laughs> um, then I would probably be all over that, but did you ever see um spy kids yes might be a bit yeah the second one yeah, with all those yeah. little those little things i was obsessed <laughs> with that when i was younger if things like that were existed i'd be all over that but i think reptiles <laughs> is the most exotic thing you can keep to yourself so yeah absolutely. that's probably the thing that sparked it the obsession of being able to have something so exotic oh uh -huh. yeah it's very interesting like being able yeah. to provide enrich or like just a nice enriching environment in your home for these tiny animals that have existed for so much longer than humans have it's awesome and with taking ownership um of the animal comes a lot of responsibility which i don't yeah. think people i stress over the responsibility of it i mean because mm -hmm. because i'm so big on welfare and spout like i think about non-stop like is this good enough is this good enough like i stress mm -hmm. over it 
Oh, so I, I, I cannot relate to the people that just stick it in a tub and forget about it for 30 years at all. Every five yeah, minutes, that... I'm like questioning myself. and <laughs> That just stresses me out thinking about doing that. <laughs> mm-hmm, exactly. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Once again, go follow Gracie and Liam. All of their social media should be linked in the description or to search EFG Exotics and Reptiles and Research. This has been a great conversation. So thank you so much, Liam, for joining us today. No worries. Thank you for having me. Yes, Liam, thank you. (laughs) All right. Once again, thanks, everyone, for watching. Be sure to subscribe. Get your Reptile Coffee Club mugs so that you can help support the show and go join the Patreon. Without further ado, I will see you all in the next Reptile Coffee Club and my other